Let's go ahead and yes, go ahead and get ourselves started. Let me introduce myself and actually just kind of take uh, requests in terms of what's going on. So that is good. I can introduce some real for you guys too. So uh, my name is Glenn Katz and I am the Educational Solutions Specialist specializing in uh, AEC, so Architecture, Engineering, and Construction for Autodesk. Um, when I am not touring around, and I went spend a lot of time touring around between different schools, kind of working with classes, just really my job is to help you be successful with working with the tools. So I do workshops, and oh, after we visit in a workshop, answer a lot of questions. So if you can't, uh, if, like Nora needs help in terms of getting things answered, there's a whole network of people who are back there to help answer questions and like that. It's just what to do. So, yeah, it's really the whole of the beginning of a relationship in terms of keeping you going with different things. If there's something we don't cover today, you know, don't let it drop because we uh, need to get you the kind of help that you need. Um, when I'm not doing this, I am stationed at Stanford University. I teach in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering there, where our architecture program is a uh, part of that. But my background is actually in civil engineering, so I'm a construction manager slash structural slash always wanted to be in architecture and that, uh, Sort of uh, play a lot. I play a lot on TV. Oh, that's one, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I just love everything about buildings and anything you want to ask about in terms of stuff. Yeah, I love doing it. So, I'll try to figure out an answer for you. So, there's some things we wanted to kind of talk about and show you today. I have some things about, oh, they're new and the new, new releases of Revit, about how to model some different things that are, you know, maybe part of your interior design that would be good to kind of add to the equation. We talk a little about rendering and some things to speed that up and make it work more smoothly. But really, you know, and even for things that we don't cover in class, I'll be around later if you have specific questions about like little things, we'll try and make sure everyone gets answered. But are there like, you know, any favorite topics? Like one thing someone asked us about was railings and how to customize railings. And yeah, uh, I respond well to hit lists. Or just go ahead and uh, what are things that you would like to see like within our next hour and a half together? So any like specifically challenging things that you've been playing around with that are, you know, taxes you and you're really sort of wondering how to do things? Because we can help you break through some of those barriers. So, and how's your experience going? Are you running into walls, or what sort of things really give you the biggest challenges? I think modeling, um, modeling, I guess, um, having customized okay. furniture, or kind of like, um, you know, just like. Anything that's not super orthographic. I understand. That's actually okay. That sounds good. How about over here? What's um, that? There's another thing. I know a couple of us have experienced this problem that in uh, projects we're doing, the windows tend to be kind of like the windows are high up. They're like a hmm. about eleven feet off the, the ground. Okay. And so they don't show up on our floor plan, and we change the cut plane higher. Yep. But then when we change it high enough to show the windows, the doors don't show up. Exactly. I got a solution. Okay, that sounds good. We're going to remind me when you start looking at floor plans to tell you about plan regions. I'll get you there in just a second. Okay, what else we got going around? Anything else? Don't worry, don't, don't be shy. I'm like, yeah, I'm very questioning answer. Yes? Um, I'm going to learn how to use the Q tool a little bit better. Because mm -hmm. um, right now, I know we use the extrusion, and, and others are going to pull other tools that you can use to modify the or. Beautiful. Okay, we'll actually do a couple scoops today. That'll be good. And I'll kind of get you going down that path, and that sort of ties into the customizing of the furniture and stuff like that. Okay. But don't be shy as we go through this. If something pops into your head at any point, or we don't even cover it in class, stick around and ask. Yeah, just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's meant to be very free form as a workshop for you. So, like, jump in at any point in terms of, uh, like, adding more questions to the list. But I'll try to make sure we cover some of this good stuff. Okay, so I have up on my screen, this is Reddit Architecture, the 2012 version of it. There's about to be a 2013 version of it, which is it's very, very similar. There are not many big changes to it, but the biggest changes that you'll sort of see within it is kind of two big things. In the new version, um, the architectural tools, the structural modeling tools, and the systems modeling tools, things for like air conditioning and plumbing and electrical systems, they're all in a single package. So you don't need to kind of download and install three different things. You know, kind of a nice integration of all those things, so that when you're modeling things, you can think about how all the systems work together. There's also some things that I think will be relevant to you guys that are nice. Uh, there's new workflows built in, so that if you want to take your Revit model out to either uh, 3ds Max and do a rendering there, or to Showcase, which is sort of another rendering tool for kind of very quick visualizations. It's uh, just like you know, choose a single menu choice, and it'll package up the model, take your materials 
send it on over. So right now there's about four or five steps to make that happen right. I think it's a lot better in terms of making that happen. So sweet workflows and that ain't look out for. But hopefully you're a little better in that release. But for now we'll focus on 2012 because that's what you have on your machine. Um, all the software, like most of you know, is available for download. You can get any of the stuff at students.autodesk.com and download the 2011 or the 2012 or soon the 2013 versions of all this stuff. Um, that includes the 3DS Max and Maya, like all these different tools. So really, you have pretty free access to all this stuff. And please do go ahead and download it and take advantage of it. You know, it seems like, ooh, we're getting a great steel deal here. Like, you know, but it's really it's intended to be that way. We want you to have access to software and play with it. So please do. Okay, in terms of what's going on here in the interface, this is the basic model the interface. And like most of you've been working with it already, right? So you got you, you, you put walls and doors and windows and all that kind of stuff in there, and that's really pretty good. Okay, so good. We'll start from that and move beyond. What I'll do is I'll go ahead and create a little model that has oh, some walls and doors and windows, and we'll use it as a basis for really starting to illustrate some of these other concepts. So for example, I'm just going to go grab the wall tool. And I'll choose a wall that actually has a couple different surfaces to it. Because all those generic walls, they're not very fun. Let me go ahead and pull up like, oh, like a brick on CMU or EIFS on metal studs. I'll do the brick on CMU. We seem to like brick around here. So I'm going to draw some walls. As I draw my walls and place them all in there, everything's kind of going pretty well. Let me finish out the building over here. I tend to draw walls very, very quickly because it's so easy to go ahead and just move things around later. So I try to just get the overall idea down and then kind of tweak the dimensions a little bit later as we go. As you go through and place all these things down, be aware of a couple different things. Like by default, the views show up at a coarse level of detail. Okay. If I turn that up to either medium or fine, you'll actually start to see all the different wall layers. Okay. And you can even shade that if you want. Now, there's something for you just to kind of think about, though, as you do go ahead and work. I tend to like to turn on those things. My models tend to be very simple because I'm demonstrating different things. I like to turn on all that stuff. As you work, though, you may not want to turn on all that stuff because as you turn up the coarseness, as you turn on the shading, it actually slows things down a little bit. So if you're finding that as you're working, as you try to pan or rotate or whatever, it's kind of... If it's doing that to you, okay, just turn back some of those things and it'll actually speed things up quite a bit. Shadows in particular seem to be something that really slow things down. So I love shadows for more of the final presentation. When I'm sort of exploring shadows, I'll turn those on. But don't leave them on all the time. If you don't need them, it's just kind of slowing things down. Or let's kind of even talk about something you can do to kind of combat that. Like, typically we have this level one floor plan. I'm going to put my doors, doors, windows in here. Everything's kind of getting layered in here. Okay, start thinking about having different views for different purposes. And you can turn things on and off in because you don't have to have just a single view. In fact, as you create construction documents and create presentation views, put on your boards and working views where it shows all the detail that you need versus more of a construction document view, if you want to turn on and off different things. So be very free about doing this. You have no hesitation about saying, hey, I got the level one view. Let me duplicate that. Okay, You can choose either duplicate it as is or duplicate it with detailing. The difference being if you duplicate it without the detailing, you get all the model elements, but none of the dimensions, none of the text, none of the tagging will show up. Okay. If you do, do duplicate it with detailing, then those things will get copied too. So just decide which is going to be more appropriate for you as a starting point. I'm going to duplicate this. So great. This is going to be my level one shaded and shadows. Okay. So for this view, because this is the one I want you to look at when I want to look at shadows, I'll turn on the shadows and I'll leave the coloring turned on. Whereas this one over here, Okay, I'll leave those off. So go ahead and think about having a lot of different views. I especially do that with like elevations. I turn on shadows for the presentation elevations, but for my working drawings, I turn that stuff off just because it slows things down. I don't need to kind of keep them turned on all the time. So be aware of some of that stuff. Okay, as you go through and you place your, oh, I'll just put some walls and doors and windows in here. And I'll just go dropping some things in on level one. And do not fault me for my bad design. I'm just throwing things down quickly. And I'll put some windows in there too. 
just for the purpose of illustration. Actually, I did a bad job on those windows. Let's kind of stop and kind of focus on that for a second. As I'm putting the windows in, be kind of aware there's this notion of windows have an inside and an outside to them. And if you find yourself always having your windows inside out, always pull slightly to the outside. Okay, and your outside will stay on the outside. Okay, and that's kind of the trick to doing that. If you always kind of pull just beyond the outside of the center line, things will go well there. Okay, you're probably used to, uh, for all these different things like, oh, windows and things like that, the, the notion of being able to use uh, like dimensions as uh, ways to sort of align things and kind of keep things constrained nicely. But there's some really just very nice tricks available in here. Things like, you know, I have those things, they just happen to be evenly spaced right now. Let me turn on the equality state to uh, reinforce that or to enforce that so that if I go through and like stretch or uh, shrink things, they'll stay evenly spaced. There's a lot of kind of just, you know, little cool editing tricks, but I won't bog you down with all that stuff. There's a lot of nice stuff in terms of doing that. Other things that, oh, the classic thing I always run into walls is, the classic thing with walls is people have the inside on the outside and the outside on the inside, that whole thing. And the trick you need to know for that is just watch out for this. As you draw your walls, if you draw your walls in a clockwise direction, excuse me, Okay, your outside will stay on the outside. That's clockwise. Okay, whereas if you draw walls in a counterclockwise direction, I'll do this. What's going to happen is the brick's going to show up on the interior, or what I think of as the interior. So hopefully that'll make a little bit of sense, but not to despair. If you do go ahead and have walls that are flipped, you could always just choose them and use these little controls to kind of get them to flip over the way they need to be. Okay, so just little random tips in terms of doing that. I'm just thinking about the things my students always run into and the issue of the walls and the being inside out is kind of a classic. So let's get rid of those. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put a floor under this space just because it's nice to have a floor to kind of get us going thinking about the interior. I'll choose my floor tool. On the floor tool, I can go ahead and choose the type of floor. And you've been, you've been playing around with different sort of wall assemblies, things that have different layers or different floor assemblies that have like a finished floor versus a subfloor. You've been playing around with materiality a little bit. Okay, well, we'll, we'll sort of show you how that all works. For any of the floor types or the wall types, it all sort of works like this. You can choose a type. If you want to sort of understand how it's constructed, like this wood floor, we can edit it and look at its structure. And you'll see that it's actually made up of nine and a quarter inches of some sort of a structural wood joist. Then there's some wood sheathing about three quarters of an inch. There's this other thing, wood flooring on top of it, three quarters of an inch. And all these different sort of surfaces, all these different layers are mapped to materials. So for the wood flooring right now, if I go clicking on this little button, it'll take me to the materials dialog. I can see how wood flooring is defined. And right now it looks like it's kind of this light birchy color, something like that. There's two different things you need to know about sort of uh, the materials. One is they have a shaded appearance, and the other is they have this uh, rendered appearance. Okay, the shaded appearance just being this color working in conjunction with the surface pattern here. So go ahead and you can go ahead and change that color manual if you want to. But an even better thing to do is go ahead and change the rendered appearance and then let the color from the rendered appearance determine the shading. That way they always kind of stay in sync with each other. So let me show you what I mean by that. I got wood flooring over here. It's this kind of light color. If I go over to the render appearance, I can see how that's actually defined, kind of this beech wood. Okay, that's not looking too bad. If I'd like to choose some other flooring surface, let me go down to the wood section of the library. See what I got in here. I want to get something really dark so you'll see the difference. Coco Bolo, I always like that one. That's a little different, kind of this deep red color, something like that. Now, if I want to go ahead and use that on my floor, I can go back to graphics, and as opposed to kind of keeping this very kind of pale kind of color, I can say use the rendered appearance for the shading, and it'll darken it up. It'll pick up really what is the primary color in that photo. Okay, and then it'll sort of keep it in sync with us. So that might be my wood flooring. 
Now, if you need to go ahead and create new wood floors or new materials, <coughs> feel free to do that. Let's go ahead and say wood flooring. And I'll say light. And for that floor surface, I'll go ahead and choose one of the other ones. Oh. Panelized silver honey maple rosewood solid stained. Cool. She's that. Oops, I should have actually shown you. Let's go back over here. I got ahead of myself. Okay, it's going to pick up that same color in there. So choose the materials that you want. You can choose the surface pattern. The surface pattern only shows up in the shading, it doesn't actually show up in how it's actually going to go through and render. The rendering is actually determined by a couple different things. Okay. There's this whole notion of the image that we put in there. There's also something called a bump map, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too, where we can actually sort of oh, add a little bit of distressing, add the, the simulation, simulated appearance as though things are either distressed or embossed, kind of by using black and white images overlaid with our photographs. But we'll get to that. So let me go ahead and put this floor in there. Okay, When you put in the floor, you could go ahead and draw edges. But I tend not to do that. The problem with drawing things is when you draw things, it's just a line, that's its boundary, but it's not really associated with anything. It's actually much more powerful to pick walls as the boundaries. Because if you pick the walls as the boundary, the nice thing is if anything about the wall changes, the boundary of the floor is going to move with it. So you get a little like double mileage out of uh, any of the changes. So let me go ahead and pick that. I'm going to use the pick tool. I'll pick these walls. I can kind of pick them one at a time. But look, we actually show you a shortcut for that if you're sort of really familiar with doing this. Kind of a nice thing you can do that's really a little bit quicker is anytime you need to sort of put a boundary around something and there's a nice continuous loop, for example, these walls, I can hover right over that first wall. And if you tab, it'll actually select all the walls. So if I tab, I get the whole bunch. Okay, and just with one click, get the entire boundary. So. That's often kind of a nice little time saver too. We'll put that in there. There's my floor. Now, why did I want to make that sort of association between the walls and the floors? Because if the walls go, if the walls move, the floors can move with it, and I don't have to go through and kind of keep on changing those elements independently. So, hopefully, I'll just save you some time to think about doing that. But let me pop over to the 3D view. And I will shade this view just so we can get a better sense of what's going on here. Okay, no, let's just start playing around here a little bit here. Okay, so here's the deal. We're looking at this thing. We're currently looking at it kind of in a shaded view. The shaded view kind of takes into account not only the color, but it also takes into account really the effect of where the lighting source is. So if the lighting source by default is up in the top right, okay, this wall is going to show it up dark. This wall is showing up just on relatively light. Now, as you design, that may be annoying, it may give you an inaccurate perception of what you need to sort of understand about where those are really the same color. You can go ahead and just say, change it to consistent colors, which will then ignore the effect of the lighting. It'll just show you the coloring, stuff like that. So you may want to turn that off. That's not how it'll be perceived. Shaded is actually probably more accurate, okay? But this may help you to sort of understand how things are in terms of where they need to be. Another mode that came in, which is kind of fun, is realistic mode. That showed up in, I think it was 2011. Might have been 2012. But what that does is it gives you what I'll call renderings on the cheap. Okay, where what it does is if I have an image that has been assigned, if there's a render image assigned to the material, it'll show you that render image. Okay. It won't go ahead and take into account uh, ray tracing and lighting effects and glossiness. There's a lot of things it doesn't do. But at least for the idea, is there an image assigned to that thing that will paste it on there? So I get a pretty good sense that, OK, what's going on right now? The floor seems to have a material. The door has a material. I'm not so sure about the frame. That might just be a color right now. The brick on the outside of the building, that's too dark. You can't even see it. There's brick on the outside of that thing. <laughs> Yeah, it has a material, and you can start uh, just start understanding where the materials have been assigned. Now, my rooms tend not to look like this. This room is a little bit kind of simplistic in the way it works. In that I got the walls coming right on down to the floor. There's no baseboard. There's no trim. It's really looking pretty spare right there. Chances are the rooms that you're designing aren't quite that spare. 
Okay. And if you need to go ahead and start putting in their trim, trim in there and putting in a little detailing to kind of really complete how this is going to work, there are really some very good tools for doing that. The whole notion of baseboards or even kind of chair rails or like a picture rail or even you know, some sort of crown molding, those are all handled by sweeps. Okay, the idea is you have some sort of profile. We're going to trace the boundary all the way around the room. We're going to just draw that profile all the way around the room. And there's a really good tool called wall sweeps, which is kind of a special purpose sweep with the general sweep, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit later. But it's a special purpose instance of that. And let's show you how it works. Where if, for example, I wanted to put some sort of a molding around this room, I can say wall. And way down towards the bottom, there's this notion of a sweep. Now, by default, there's really only a single sweep loaded into the project. It's some piece of what they're calling cornice. It's a pretty ugly one for that matter, but let's kind of put it in there to show you how it works. I can go ahead and put it on this wall, maybe above the doors. And I'll go through and put it on this wall. And if I want to keep on rotating around, I can put it on that wall and kind of just keep on going around the room. Now, it's pretty good about what it does, but it's, well, let me kind of show you what the advantage of these wall sweeps are in terms of what's really nice about them. It's sweeping around the room, and that looks pretty good in terms of what's going on. A nice feature about the wall sweeps is if you happen to have a wall sweep that does intersect a door or a window, it'll be pretty smart about what it does. So it'll actually leave out the door or the window and kind of actually give you a lot of control over how that happens. So the nice thing is, you know, it's there. Um, it's leaving out that door or that window. If you go through and do something like move the door or the window, okay, it'll be smart enough to kind of keep that sweep adapted. So it's actually a nice way to do it because as opposed to sort of having to manually tweak these sweeps and everything, it's going to always stay connected towards, uh, you know, or it's going to interact smartly with the other elements. If I add a new door or a window, it'll kind of do the right thing in terms of what's going on. So sweeps are good for things like, oh, like uh, chair rails or something like that. That's not necessarily the nicest looking sweep in terms of what's going on. So let's take a look at how it's defined. It's like this big old blocky rectangular thing. If I edit it, I can give it a material. I could also sort of say, oh, what is its profile? If I want to give it a different profile, I can go to the library and actually sort of pull in some different profiles and sort of see what else is in there. There aren't that many things loaded into this one yet. Maybe we'll load a new one and we'll apply it instead. Okay. But let's at least go ahead and say, you know, this uh, material by category, which is kind of this default gray material, that's not looking very good. Let me at least go ahead and assign some sort of material. I'm going to go ahead and say, oh, oh what is this? This is my interior moldings. Let's go ahead then. What would that material actually be? Let me go ahead and what can I do to it? I will make it some sort of pink color. Like I'll just make it a bright white right now. Only for the sake of making it easy to see. I'll shade it so it's using that color. Surface pattern. No, nah, we don't want it to have that kind of diagonal or that kind of tile pattern on it. So at least it's bright white now. Okay, but let's go ahead and like do something a little bit better. Let's give a load in a couple different profiles, which might give us a little bit more architectural interest. And how we do that is we can go to the insert tab and we're going to load some families. Profiles are just families and you can load in some of the existing ones or even create your own. They're really just, a profile is really just a line, a loop of lines. Okay, so you can define them to really be whatever you want. But they have some nice baseboards. That's a pretty good looking baseboard. Maybe I'll load that one in. Let me go ahead and load in another one there. I'm going to load in again from the library. Let me load in some profiles. There's some crown moldings. What else is in here? That's cornice. That's not so good. Eh, I'll use that one. Okay, so I've loaded in some profiles. So far, so good. I have profiles to work with, but I don't actually have them associated with a sweep just yet. So what you do with that is you go back to that sweep and you edit it. 
And you say that, hey, I don't just want to be the default profile. I want to be that casing profile. And you can sort of choose what size you want it to be. When you say, OK, OK, now you have something that's really a lot better in terms of what's going on. It's a little bit far. I might want to tweak it just a little bit further. You see that little blue dot? It's intersecting the door frame right now. If it's sort of having a bad intersection, I can pull it back just a hair. So think about how you can go through and use sweeps. Like that's a good sweep for like uh, if we want to do the chair rail, something like that. If I want to create another sweep to do something like the base molding or something like that, I'll say wall sweep. I don't want to use this one. In fact, this one I should probably even change its name. I'm going to call that the chair rail. I will duplicate this and create one called baseboard. What's it going to be? It's going to be somewhat similar, but it's instead going to be, oh, let's see if we can find that base. Give it a nice tall base. And now I can go ahead and apply that on the bottom of the floor right there. And again, wrap that around the room. Again, notice that it sort of tries to interact smartly with the doors, things like that. Can't really see it very well. Maybe I should paint that thing too. Edit it. Material. Looks like it is interior moldings. Hmm. That should be good. Paint white. I'm just checking sort of why it's not giving me what I think it should be giving me. Is it just because, oh, it's just because I'm sort of uh, highlighting in a funny way. Let me go back to the uh, shaded or the consistency. You can sort of see it there. Okay, so far so good. So apply these moldings, do stuff like that. Now, another thing you may want to do is check out those windows. Those windows are looking pretty naked over there too. And if you like windows that have a little bit of molding or trim, and I understand, are you working on, what, what kind of renovations are you working on or interiors you're working on? Are you doing anything that has any sort of interesting moldings and trims around the windows or very modern? What do you have? So you may actually have, you know, relatively plain jams and things like that. You think about whether the sill has anything interesting going on to it. Like, so if we wanted to go ahead and start customizing, let's say like you want to do something like here. We want this relatively plain jam over there, and we just kind of want to play around with a sill piece or something like that. You can do that. You can do that a couple different ways. And here's how I want you to think about that. If you want to go through and just sort of apply special treatment in uh, one or two locations, okay, something that won't be part of every window, but just be a special treatment in a couple places, okay. Think about doing it as an in-place piece of geometry. You're just going to go ahead and put it on that one or two specific windows and leave it at that. And how we would do that is, there's this under the Home tab, we can sort of bring in components. That was where we bring in things like, oh, you know, doors and windows and pieces of furniture. If I want to model something in place, I can say, oh, it's going to be part of the window. Let me go ahead and put in there, I'll just say it's going to be, oh, like some sill trim. And we can think about what that should be. It could be an extrusion. Sweep is often a good choice for doing trim because we often have these profiles we want to sweep. What I'll do is I will pick a path and I will just pick the bottom of this window right there. I'll say that's the path I want to use. Then I can go ahead and find the profile I want, and I can choose which kind of profile. Maybe I'll use one of those casing profiles that I've already loaded. Close that up. Okay, and now I have it. It's just attached to that window. Cool thing is, again, if I move the window, okay, it'll follow it around. It'll kind of do the right thing. So when you can go ahead and attach things to other pieces of geometry that they should move with, Think about linking them. Pick the edges and do something like that. Now, another way to do this is you can say, oh, but you know, I don't just want that. Maybe that's just that one window, but really for most of the windows, and it won't be for yours, and maybe I do want to put a little piece of trim that's going all the way around the edges and stuff like that and have that part of my down there. So although Revit comes out and is like, you know, pretty mundane, plain, ordinary doors and windows out of the box, they own this thing. Go ahead and kind of change it to really be what you want it to be. So if you want to have more trim, you want to kind of change things that are a little more kind of 
you know, articulated and a little more uh, just, uh, well designed. Yeah. Go ahead and like uh, start owning these objects and kind of make your own. So how you can do that is, let's say for example, I want to change that window and do something nice to it. I can grab the window, and for any piece, it's going to work whether it's the door, the window, almost any of these pieces. You have the choice of editing them, and if you edit them, this is how that window is actually defined right now. If I go around to the front of the window versus the back of the window. This is what we're looking at inside. If I want to start basically adding some trim to that window and kind of changing it, I can do that same sort of thing. I'm going to add a sweep to it. I'll pick the lines that I want to add the sweep to. Maybe I'll add them on these interior edges. So it kind of leaps over those or laps over those a little bit. Then I can go through and again apply a profile. But don't again feel that you have to go ahead and just use one of the profiles that's in the library. If you have your own profile that you want to use, you have a specific piece that you've seen that some manufacturers making you want to use it, or really design your own, say that, hey, no worries, I can sketch a profile and let me edit it. What I can then do is just sort of draw any kind of custom loop that you want. So I want it to come out to here. It's going to come out like that, have a little notch here, notch back over there. It'll have, oh, some sort of little indentation to it. Whatever it is, it sort of seems to make sense to you. Okay, not necessarily a great looking piece of trim, but it'll illustrate the point. When I say complete that, it'll complete the profile, and then I can actually complete the sweep. And now I have kind of a very elaborate, could be a very period piece of trim. Okay, now, if you do go ahead and change things, no worries, but save them away as your own name. Don't just put them back in the library replacing the existing one, because if you put them back in the library replacing the existing one, anything that in that same prod watch, and you're gonna overwrite the one that you could be using on the next found in the next project. Um, but anything on this project which is using that same part will automatically inherit this change you made to it. So think about whether you really want everything to inherit the change or you want to save that out and have a one-off. Just you know, go ahead and kind of do whichever way you need. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a save as because I want to keep my uh, little window trim thing hanging around over there. I'm going to put it out there and it's going to call... Uh, we'll say custom window with elaborate trim. Okay, and now I can load that into my project. I'll bring it back into that project we were just looking at. So now, I can either go ahead and place one of the new ones with the elaborate trim. Okay, or I can even go back and change one of the existing ones from a plain old window to the new one with the elaborate trim. And the nice thing is, because you defined it this way, it doesn't matter whether it's a tall, skinny window or kind of a relatively short and squatty one, whatever it is, that trim's gonna adapt and kind of do nice things for you there. So I guess the, the point of all this is really, uh, you know, what is it? Yeah. Own your parts. Take control of your parts and really make them work for you. Don't go ahead and kind of take what Revit has out of the box because you know, there, you know, it shouldn't be limiting your design freedom. If you have it in your head, with a little bit of work, we can probably get Revit to go ahead and represent it the way you want it. Okay, let me show you just a couple other random tricks in terms of walls and surfaces. Then we'll get into modeling more kind of complex forms. And you know, one of my favorite things in terms of just thinking about walls and surfaces is you know, the notion of painting. Have you ever played around with painting much? Okay. Painting is this great way. If you got a wall that's a jetboard wall and you've made most of your walls so they have like a plain white jetboard surface, if you want to have an accent wall that's red or blue or green, or you want to put some sort of wood panel in it or something like that, painting is sort of like changing materials on your sheet. Okay, so you could go ahead and create a whole new wall type that has a different material to it, but really, when it comes time to sort of say that this is accent color one, and this is accent color two, and that's the base color, you probably don't need to go through and create you know, three different wall types to make that happen. Okay. So paint, like we do 
in the real world is actually an effective way of doing it. So if you want to go ahead and paint things, just sort of change the surface color to something else, it's easy to do. There's this tool, let me go ahead and choose the wall, and it's kind of floating around right over here, the paint tool. It'll basically let you choose some other surface material. For example, if I want that to be, oh, this masonry stone wall, I can choose that material, then choose this wall surface. When I say done, oh, I'll tell you what's going on. It's because it's not realistic yet. Hang on. There it is. And it'll pop it into that wall. So you could always paint things. If I want to go back to that wall and instead paint it, oh, something else, like to look like a glass block wall. That won't render very well. Let me do this masonry wall instead. <laughs> Okay, we can sort of paint some different surfaces on there. <laughs> Parking stripe yellow. That'll be attractive. <laughs> okay, so you can go ahead and paint different walls now. Painting is sort of a fantastic technique. Okay, it gets you a lot of mileage really quickly. But it does sort of have a limitation in that. When you paint the wall, it's going to paint the entire wall. Okay, so maybe not so bad in this room. There's only one wall here. But think about this building. If you model this building, this wall may be the wall that's in this room, and the next room, and the next three rooms. Okay, so if I paint this wall, it's actually going to paint the surface like of all four rooms, and that may not be the thing that happen. Okay, so we need a way to control painting and make it a little more refined about what it does. Okay, and how we do that is just another really kind of tool called splitting the surface. So if you can imagine that, as opposed to painting the entire wall, I can split the surface here and have this painted one color and that painted a different color. Or maybe I want to have one material up here and a different material down in the landscape, whatever it is. You can split them up and apply different materials. Okay, and just get to a result really quickly. So let's show you how you do that. So that's again, something that gets you a lot of mileage. So here's how that works. Okay, I got my wall, it's all painted in kind of a horrific color. But right above the painting tool, there's this little guy here, and I can't stand this icon. It looks like a little cathode ray tube. I'm not sure what it is. It look, it's, it's supposed to basically be that you're splitting a surface, but there's uh, splitting the face. I can grab that tool, and here's how it works. What you do is you choose some surface that you want to split. Maybe I'll do it to this wall over here. Let me make that consistent color just so you can see what I'm up to. I'm going to grab that wall over here. Okay, when I grab that wall, what it's doing is it's putting a little orange line around all the boundaries in that wall. So if I want to split off a part of that wall now, what I do is I just drag a line across, and if I cross boundaries to really kind of split things into two different regions, okay, now, this lower part of the wall is actually separate from the upper part of the wall because I split that off. What that does for us is if we go through and we say that we want to paint, let me find something a little bit better than uh, that color. i put grass on the wall. No, we won't. We'll go through and put some sort of, again, oh, a wood veneer on the wall. What I'll do is I'll choose, let's see if I can get to it. It's hard to see, it's just that lower portion right there. Can you see it's highlighting just a little right there? That's it. I'm just gonna paint that piece of it and say done. And again, I'll only go back to realistic so you can actually see it. So now I have, oh, it's more like a wood paneling down in the bottom part of the wall versus the upper part of the wall being sort of painted uh, kind of more generic. In fact, let me go through and do this because since my jip board color is so dark, you can't really see the difference very strongly. Let me just change the color of that thing because that makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. Here's jip board. It's kind of currently very, very kind of medium or to dark gray. Let me go ahead and change it so that it's going to be a painted surface, which is... I'll start with kind of a white color. But really, even if I want to tint that a little, let me go ahead and I'll lighten it up, but I'll also give it a little bit of color. Mm, kind of like a tan, one of those fawny colors or something like that. Right in there. Say okay to that. Oops. What I didn't do 
I don't, I'm always too fast on this because I should like stop and do it, is after I change the render appearance, go back and say, use the render appearance for the shading also. Okay, make sure you go ahead and grab that. That doesn't look like it's doing a very good job of grabbing that color, does it? Hmm. Well, hopefully it'll lighten it a little. Something's not quite right. Well, let me just lighten it up again so you can just sort of see it. We'll figure out what I'm doing wrong in a minute. This is making me wonder whether or not that wall... Now, it should be Jipboard. Let me just check to be certain. <laughs> oh, it's realistic. That's okay. Shaded. There we go. So you start having the difference between that wall and that wall. So you can go ahead and break walls. You can not only break walls kind of going across, uh, you know, horizontally like that. You can also go through and break walls. If you just want sort of a part of a wall to be accented, let me grab that wall and I'll just split the face as opposed to doing it that way. Let me do a vertical break instead. Okay, now that part of the wall is going to be separate from this. So if again I paint and I'll choose, oh, what do I want to put on that side of the wall? What do I have that's nice and ugly? Uh, ceramic blue top. Okay, we'll put that over here. Say done. Okay, so feel free to go ahead and split things up. You get a lot more mileage in terms of, yeah, go ahead. Well, okay, that's kind of interesting because it's, if, if your bitmap has enough quality, you can definitely scale it to get it to the right size. It really comes down to like how much you know resolution there is to the bitmap image that you're using. So scaling, you need to scale the images. I find myself like playing around too much with the scaling, and it just has this like, awkward position. Like, yeah, yeah. Let's just kind of show you like what the question is. So here's the deal. Let me just do the realistic, and you start to get a sense of what this is doing. So here we are. Those are like little blue mosaics. Uh, it's so dark you can't see what's going on. And it's like little blue mosaic tiles. I'm trying to think how we can lighten that up. Hmm. Well, let me keep it going this way. It's still, yeah. Hang on, I'm going to turn off. I'm going to turn off the lights. It's really good. It'll be a little bit easier to see. Maybe not. Okay. If I go through and I change into the realistic... There's these little kind of mosaic tiles, and that may or may not be the effect you want. If you want to go through and change that, let's go over to Manage, and we'll take a look at the materials. And what did I call that? Was that ceramic tile? Blue. There it is. Four-inch blue. We'll go over to the Appearance tab. Here's the image that it's defined by. You can go through and take a look at it. See if I can edit the image. Here's the actual image. And if you want to change the pattern size, here's where you need to do it. So it's saying that those four tiles measuring across from here to here are one foot four. If you want that instead to be like a two foot eight or something like that to make them twice as big. That's interesting. Everywhere else I can type this thing without having to put the uh, like feet and inches in here. But the materials editor, I have to actually sort of mess around with it. Okay. So what's going to happen? That's just going to render a whole lot bigger now. So there it is. It just, you know, <laughs> you can't tell. Let me, uh, let me do it again and make it even bigger because it's really, uh, I'm scaled in so far you can't even see the difference. Let's make that, oh, uh, what is it, five foot four? Which will mean I have some big 16 inch tiles or something like that. Okay, say done to that. And I have to do a little, uh, there it is. A little tweaking and now they're a lot bigger but the the limitation on this is really it's this notion of like how much resolution you have in the image to 
we scale them up to the, uh, the eventually the sort of team brain. You know, so that would be a way to kind of fix that. Although, play very creatively with this, because a lot of times, oh, I take little small patterns and I stretch and distort them and make all sorts of other things out of them. You know, it's, you can get a lot of creativity in terms of like this, yeah, thinking about your images a little bit differently. Okay, so go ahead and like, yeah. Yes. We're all for power. Yes. Good, excellent. Thank you. Okay, let me give you a one other little kind of painting tip that may hopefully save you some time and be useful to you. And that is this. There's this funny notion of something called a decal, which is really, really useful. I'll show you how that looks. I'll turn the lights back on. Okay, decals are this. Ah, that's great. Decals let you take any image and plaster it all over a wall. Plaster it all over what you want to have be an artwork in your building, plaster it all over a TV screen, plaster it all over whatever you want it to be. And the idea is that you have a bitmap image, we can use it to actually sort of simulate something going on. So on my wall over here, which is looking perfectly yellow, and I want to put some artwork on here and I actually have it rendered properly, I can grab images from my library. I can grab it from my pictures, your favorite photos from your last vacation, um, things that you've created for classes. You know, really put your custom artwork in these things. Similarly, if you have a TV or a big new screen media system in there, you can put some image on the surface of it and actually you know, really improve the, uh, what is it, the, the quality of the render. They look a lot better when they have a little life to them. So how you do that is as follows. Under the Insert tab, you'll find this thing called Decals. And decals let you basically go out and grab things, just grab images. I'm going to create a new decal. This is going to be my poster one. Okay, I'm going to go out and grab an image. Sadly, I don't have great images on this machine. I actually try to keep this machine pretty lean. So I don't have a whole lot. Well, actually, I might have something. I take that back. I keep on putting up this picture of myself, and that's really uh, that's not a good thing. So let's see if we can actually find any other images in here. Uh, video badges. Oh, we'll do that. Okay, let me grab one of these. Jeez. Digging deep. It's going to be an image of a computer screen. Not that they'll make a great computer, uh, uh, a great image, but it'll give you a sense. As though you were illustrating the screen I have at the front of your room here. <laughs> okay. Decals work like this. You can go sort of place them on any surface. I can put them on the floor. I can put them on the door. I sound like uh, Dr. Seuss. I can <laughs> drop them wherever I want to. And if you want to choose them, you can start stretching them out proportionally. Okay. And just put them wherever you like. Okay. The nice thing about decals, and again, it's sort of this whole thing, how do you do rendering things kind of very quickly? And I said on the cheap, that's kind of a bad way to say it. You're going to hurry efficiently. Yeah. If you have, let's say, for example, I'm modeling, oh, it was some very elaborate you know, building that has a, a library with a wall full of books and artwork and exotic molding and stuff like that. And I'm sort of working on this side, but I want to have that in the background. Okay. What you can do is, Get that image, take a picture, grab a picture of the room, take that image and just plaster it onto that wall. And you'll sort of get the effect of that being there and without having to do all the modeling for that. So I do that a lot with like cityscapes and streetscapes sort of stuff where I'll put buildings in which are big old rectangular blocks, but I can take the image of the building and slap it on the front of that block and all of a sudden they have all the detailing of the windows and the, the ornamentation and all the signage and stuff like that. So it's really kind of a nice way of just leveraging photography to kind of get better with the images. So don't be afraid to do that. That's actually kind of a cool thing to do. How you would do something like that, and this won't make a whole lot of sense here because I don't have a good image for it, but I'll take the decal. I'll do something like put it here. And all I'm really going to do is stretch it. Now, this isn't going to interact nicely with the windows because the decals aren't smart enough to act. I take that back. I lied to you. It does interact nicely with the windows, and that really actually surprises me. It's smarter than I thought it was going to be. Okay, so if you could instead envision that as a nice library wall full of books and artwork, that would actually save you a lot of time in terms of trying to model that. 
And the cool thing about that is then as you orbit, whatever you do, it'll stay in view. It'll look good in perspective in terms of what's going on. So uh, yeah, leverage photography whenever you can. Okay. Does that make sense? Excellent. Okay. I was going to shift gears now a little bit and talk to you about just sort of modeling complex forms and furniture and how to make different things that you can't make very easily or right out of the box. So that sound good? Excellent. Okay, let us start with that. In terms of modeling things, there's a couple sort of really cool techniques you know about. One of which is called using masses to go ahead and create unusual shapes. Because it's that whole question of the orthogonality. Oh, I'm sorry. On the plan view, let me not forget that. Okay, I remember that about the plan view in the windows. I, I keep a little list and I try to be honest. Okay, here's the deal. Just because it was a special request. I got some windows. They're clear story windows. They're kind of hanging up there and they're looking relatively high. Here's a doorway. I'll go to the floor plan view. <laughs> At four feet, I don't necessarily see the windows the way I want to. So you say, ah, I know what to do. I'm going to range the view range. Okay. At which point, here's level one. I'll change the view range. I'm going to change it up to eight feet or whatever it is. Apply that. Now the doors disappeared, but the windows are showing up. Okay, problem. So let's go ahead and fix this. I'll put that back to four. Okay. What you really want is you want to change the view range, but you don't want to change it everywhere. You just want to change it in that teeny tiny little space, right where that third story window is. So how do you do that is, under the views, there's a special little thing available to you called, there's plan views, but there's also something called a plan region. And what is a plan region? It's really just the ability to go ahead and take a teeny tiny little area, Actually, I shouldn't overlap that. That's kind of dumb. But to say that in this area, however big that area is, I want it to have a special view range. Be eight foot there, but not eight foot anywhere else. And when you choose that, it'll do that. Very, very handy split level houses, raised platforms. Like anytime you have these funny height changes and you don't want to create a bunch of independent levels, yeah, it's the best way to kind of get that. Because you have half walls and countertops and the radio, you know, they don't look right when we cut at plenty of angles. Okay, so that's some plan region does. No worries. Okay, custom furniture. So let's get going. We'll start with the modeling things as masses. This is the whole orthogonality question. The problem is, as you're going through, you're doing walls and doors and windows and all that nice stuff. Revit loves it when you have these nice surfaces where everything rises perfectly vertically. It's pretty good. You know, create curves in the XY. That's kind of okay. But you can even, you know, do pro you can extrude things this way to go ahead and have barrel vaults and things like that. Yeah, but as soon as you get anything that has like two degrees of curvature to it, it really gets pretty hard to model on the others. Even things like a slanted wall are really hard to model on the others, right? The default wall tool will always be vertical. How do you get a curved, uh, sloping surface on a wall? It's pretty hard. Well, it used to be pretty hard. They added some tools a couple of years ago that finally made it possible to do these things. So it moved from, you know, downright next to impossible to at least, okay, we've got an extra step, but I can get it done. And here's how it works. We're going to play around with something called a mass. And think of a mass as really just being a piece of construction geometry. It's just something that you're going to use, almost like a dressmaker's form. We're just going to sort of put something there that we can wrap a wall or a door or a roof or a piece of glass around. Okay? And how you do that is under the massing and site tab, you can create this thing called an in place mass. By default, masses are hidden, so it's always going to give you this funny little warning. You know, hey, I don't usually have the masses visible because they're construction geometry, but I'm going to show them to you because you're going to try and edit them. So that's what it's telling us right here. And when I start creating a mass, I can do something like, let me go ahead and I'll just draw like this box on the floor. I often start with very simple things because that's kind of the easiest for me. What I can do is take that frame and I can say, let us go through and make a solid form out of it. And when you do that, you know, it's even sort of asking me what I want to do. I think it's that one. It's because I'm looking at it from a funny angle. 
I was looking at it oh, from 3D rotated, you see it's actually a box. Okay, I can start pushing and pulling on that thing, and this is kind of like SketchUp in terms of pushing and pulling and doing whatever you want to this thing. Okay, so far not very interesting because I haven't gotten any advantage out of doing these things the other way, but where this gets to be interesting is if you grab an edge. Because if you grab an edge, I could do something like slope the wall back. Okay, same thing over here. I can grab this edge and slope the wall out. Okay, now what is that good for? Let me finish this and show you. We'll say finish the mass. Okay, so far it's still just a piece of form waiting for something. Under massing in sight, there's the ability to take a wall or a roof and map it to that. So I can say, hey, let me take a wall of some type, like the brick wall, and I'll put it on the front surface here. Okay, and it's a little hard to see because it's in the realistic mode. Yeah, I actually now have a brick wall which is sloping back and sort of following that form. In the same sense, I could do something like that to the uh, little side wall over there. I can go through and, oh, I'll just make it sort of a generic wall on that side. I'm going to choose that side wall. And now I have a solid wall over there. So you can start creating walls that have almost kind of any like arbitrary shape to them in terms of doing this stuff. Now the cool thing is, if you need to kind of keep on changing that wall, you decide, oh, I want it to slope some more or less, or I want to stretch it some more, you can go back to the form and edit it. And here's the basic underlying form. I can stretch it up higher. I can push the edge back in further. Whatever it is you need to do, you can kind of keep on doing that. I'll finish that up. And you say, whoa, but hey, I stretched the form. I made these changes, but like somehow my wall didn't kind of like uh, keep up with me. And said, no worries. What you got to do is just grab that wall and there's this thing about updating it. So you get to sort of choose whether you want it to kind of keep updating with the changes to the form or whether you want it to be independent. And as soon as you say update, it'll go ahead and change itself. It'll remap itself to that form. Now, this kind of capability is kind of cool just for making sloped walls, but it's even sort of cooler when you start doing things where, let me edit in place. You take that surface, and instead of just sloping edges, you start grabbing points. Let's see if I can grab the edge of this thing. There's the point right there. If I go ahead and pull that point, and then pull that point, and do something like that, if you think about it, I've actually created a very complex surface that's curved. Because in order to go ahead and kind of draw the surface between those four different boundary lines, it's actually this thing that curves up and curves out. It's got this whole kind of compound curvature to it. Okay, I do the same sort of thing back over here to the roof or on this side. Let me kind of pull that up and pull that over again. Now this is curved and that surface is curved too. Everything's a little bit curvy now, a little more organic. Let me go ahead and finish those. Okay. I'll do a little update in place. Oh, that's interesting. That's what's going on. Okay. I will take that wall, I'll update it to place. That's kind of fine. Well, that's interesting about what it's doing there. Let me take that one out. I'll do it a little bit. No, not that one. I'm going to take this wall out because I'm going to change it and make it instead something a little more interesting. If you want to go through, and as opposed to just putting these solid walls in, you want to make them like a glass surface, you can do that. Let me grab this guy over here, and I will again say massing in sight and make a curtain system out of it. Okay, and if 5 by 10, the panel size is a little bit big for you. Again, you can change this to whatever you want it to be. I'm going to make just like a 2 by 2 grid because that'll be a little bit well, finer. We'll see more of it on that pattern. So two feet there, two feet there. And when I create the system, it'll actually put, now it's a nice curving grid. It's actually kind of following whatever shape you want. 
Now, just sort of bent and twisted surfaces, that's kind of cool in its own right, but a lot of what you start seeing now, oh, in the, some of the spaces you're gonna be designing, you don't just want sort of surfaces that look like this. You're thinking about, oh, undulating organic curves and how they're all gonna to merge together, and you've been doing stuff in Rhino that you really wanna go ahead and be able to kind of like, uh, kind of put into your models. And let's show you how you do stuff like that. If I want to go through and create another mass that has more something like that, the deal is I can take these boxes and kind of twist and distort them and stuff like that, but really I can make a surface out of any two profiles you give me. So you want to do any two curves, and I can sort of join them together and it will sweep your uh, it, uh, loft between them in terms of what you want. So if you want to create something that's a little more organic, let me go ahead and like sort of, for example, choose this spline and I'll put one of them at level one. Actually, I'll draw this from the top just so you can sort of see what I have in mind. So I'll draw, oh, some nice curvaceous thing. Okay, and that's my going to happen at the first floor level. I'm going to draw something else, but I'm going to put it up at the second floor level. Okay, now that's going to be hard to model. Let me rotate that up again. You can sort of see there's those two different curves. Okay, if I want to grab those two things and make a surface, I'll grab one, control clip and grab the other one, and I'll just say, let's make a form out of that. Okay, and now I have a big groovy surface. And within that big groovy surface, I can now go through and once I finish the mass, it's going to warn me, there's no, it's just a surface, there's no interior to that, so there's no uh, volume to it. If I want to go through and make a wall out of it, I can say make it a wall. Again, choose whatever it wants to be. Okay, and now I have a solid wall that actually does that. So, you know, you really have an awful lot of flexibility in terms of creating whatever you want. This sort of thing about doing things as masses, it's kind of one step along the lines of sort of customizing things to whatever you want. So it's good for doing things like customizing walls, customizing sort of funny ceiling plates that you want to put in there, customizing roofs. It's really good for those sort of things. Okay. Not yet very good for customizing furniture. Okay, so let's talk about that. So you can sort of see I do the same sort of thing. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see you sort of a, you know, real quickie on how you kind of create custom furniture and then finish off with just a little thing on rendering and some things you need to know about that. <coughs> okay, so custom furniture. I'm, I'm part of it, I'm going real fast. I'm just trying to squeeze a lot of stuff in here for you guys. Okay, so furniture, here's the deal. There's all that furniture that's loaded out in the libraries. It's kind of doing good. Okay, if you want to go through and create your own furniture, two ways to do it. And it's really it's the same basic technique. You're just going to decide, kind of like with that window, is it an in-place thing that you're only going to use once, or is it a family that you're going to use a whole bunch of times? Okay, so just really sort of decide. Families, reuse multiple times, in-place, it's going to be local to this project. Okay. So you can do it either way. The same basic technique works. I'll do it as a family, just so you sort of get a sense of how you kind of create so, some groovy chair that you can reuse a lot of different places. Okay, and how I'm going to do that is I'll say, let me go to new and create a new family. All families have types. The types are really just, or the categories, it determines whether or not where they show up in the hierarchy of objects. So I'm going to choose a furniture piece, just because that's what I sort of have in mind. I am looking at a new modeling environment here. It's just got sort of some XY intersections there. That's where the insertion point is. I have all my tools, extrusion, blending, revolving, things like that in here. So let's go ahead and kind of create something that, oh, I don't know, might be something you have in mind. Let me go through and do something like this. I'm going to do an extrusion. I'm going to create something, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be barrel chair-like, but not exactly, because I don't really have a good picture of that in my brain right now. But I'll draw something that's sort of like a barrel chair, and we'll go from there. So I'm going to go ahead and draw some sort of profile here. Let me gotta go, I'm going to even go through and split it. What I'm going to do is I'm actually just doing an extrusion is what I'm basically starting with. So I'm basically extruding something like this. I'm going to split it just so I can sort of uh, not have it join at the front. Actually, that's interesting. Not there. Let me try this again. I'll split that one there too. I'm just trying to get rid of that piece. 
So now I can pull this back to some angle, pull it back over here. Okay. When I want to go through and finish an extrusion, a really nice thing to do is just use the offsetting tool. If I know this thing wants to be, oh, like oh, two inches thick or something like that, I can just offset. That's really thick. My, my sense of scale is off. And then to complete the extrusion, I do need to go through and actually just uh, do something like this. I'm not quite done there. See how they're not, well, maybe they did line up. I'll, see, I'll tell you in a minute if they did or not. Let me finish this. It did line up. Okay, so I got some, let's see what it looks like. Hmm, it's my uh, barrel chair. Okay, but we need to start adding some detailing to this. Okay, we're gonna go through and, for example, maybe put a sweep around the top so we can go ahead and have uh, just some sort of nice, you know, top edge to it as opposed to, you know, extruding it up from the bottom. That actually worked out pretty good for getting started. I'm just gonna scale this up so the lines are just a little more appropriate to what we want. If I wanna go through and put like a nice, oh, like a cap on the chair, what I can do is something like this. I'll just add another piece to it. I'm gonna add a sweep to it where I can sweep. Oh, I will choose where I want to sweep. Let me kind of just sweep around the outer edge there. Okay, now I can draw a profile of what I have in mind. So that's my path. For the sweep, I'm gonna sketch something. And what am I gonna do? Oh, I think maybe the top of this thing should look like this, then come over here, then be over like this, then kind of come back down over there. Just something like that. Hmm. It's probably a little sharp that's going to hit the back of somebody's head, <laughs> which would make it a classic Frank Lloyd Wright design. <laughs> okay, then we'll like uh, more like this. How about that? And when I close this, okay, it'll just kind of sweep it all around there. So let's stop. Who's asking about sweeps? Let's, you know, think about your questions about sweeps. Is that you know, sort of what you have in mind, or...? Because sweeping is actually, you know, we could really do almost anything. Let me just put it, I'm going to drop a sweep on the ground just for the fun of it. I'll Does the sweep have to, the profile has to be connected to the line of this? Um, no, it doesn't actually. That's kind of an interesting thing. It, you're going to draw it relative to it. For example, oh, that was a bad looking sweep there. Hang on. I was just going to do a little like a spline. That's a little extreme. Watch out with sweeps. You can make things that are so sharp you can't draw them. But here's the, where the profile is going to be. And the profile, and prove me wrong, it may actually sort of be required, but I think it's just has to, it's just got to be relative to it. Okay, and then when I finish that, no. Nope. Okay, it is proving me wrong. Yeah, although, no, it could be, I'm, I'm not 100% certain. Let me try something a little bit simpler. Yeah, sometimes what's happening is just like, especially on these little curve paths. Um, let me see if that's actually true. It could be that I just sort of curved it too much. It's definitely possible to create things that are sort of too sharp to sweep. Let me see if that does any better. There we go. Yeah, so it wasn't so much an issue of the distance as in that case it was just the sharpness of the curve. It wasn't liking that. So you can sweep things like that. Actually, a really cool thing is with your sweeping, let's do this. You can, if you want to have, as opposed to just a single sweep, you want to have a blend between two shapes. What you can do is, let me show you this, a swept blend. I like these guys. Again, I'll just sort of sketch a path, a simple path. But what a swept blend does is you have profile one. I'll edit it. So on profile one, I'll do something like uh, this. And then let me close that one. Then for profile two, I'll do something else. Okay, so can we go ahead and transform this triangle into that box? And yep. So 
you really have all sorts of control in terms of doing these things. So as you go through and create your own sort of custom furniture pieces, things like this, yeah, every piece can have a material assigned with it. So there's where you assign the material. If you want to make the material a parameter that the user can change as opposed to just having it you assign it, what you can do is go ahead and say, I'm going to add a parameter called the body material. I'll make it an instance parameter. Maybe this thing up here will also have the body material. Because, you know, I probably want that railing to be the same. You can decide whether it should be or not be. Okay, maybe to finish this chair, or to almost finish this chair, I should go through and uh, just put like a, a platform where you can actually do your sit, you know, put a cushion on it or something like that. So that might be just another extrusion. Yes? Um, the same things that you're doing uh, when you're creating a family, can, is, is this sort of something that you could do in a project? Yes. It's, okay. the, yes, all, because, okay, everything that I'm doing here in terms of doing it as a family, oh, I know what's going on. This is actually sort of way tall. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is going to be my very squatty chair. Okay. But let me load this into the project. Put it on over here, and now here's barrel chair one, complete with the extra little doodahs lying around on the floor. <laughs> and now I can start rotating those around and doing whatever I want to. Okay, now, yes, you can go ahead and do that in a project. I'm just going to show that in 3D. There they all are, kind of hanging around in there. Okay, if you want to just do it in the project, it's right here home component, oops, not home. Model in place. And you'll see once we get in there, it's really just the same environment. Okay, so what I, what I tend to do is, you know, like a chair, I'll tend to use a lot of, you know, that'll make as a family. Um, for like a countertop or something like that, which is really a one off, it's going to fit this one specific room and the dimensions. Okay, that'll do in place. So it's kind of this trade off. Really, they're very, very similar in terms of what's going on. And that's kind of okay. Um, let me give you one other one just to kind of show you about the power of this stuff, and then we'll switch to the rendering stuff. Uh, and that is, cancel that. Let me go back over to that chair for a second, wherever that was. There it is. Okay. For this chair, if I go through and uh, see if I can edit the profile. Uh, pop, pop, pop. One nice thing about oh, editing stuff like this is you can add parameters to this in that if I want to have several different shares where I can sort of vary the size, I can go ahead and put a parameter in there and then basically give myself a way to control that. So if I want to say that's the chair radius, okay, and let me go ahead and finish that. Okay, what I can do now is actually start to change that numerically. So if I have a family of chairs that I all want to have work together, that one's only eight inches in diameter, and I want to have another one that's 12 inches in diameter, <coughs> radius, excuse me. I can basically have something that resizes itself. That one's not resized, I should do something so that the interior is locked to the exterior so it's always maintaining the same constant width. But this whole idea of putting parameters on your furniture gives you even one step more flexibility. Because you're gonna find out, I can take a table that looks like this, and with parameters I can make it a eight-foot conference table, I can make it a dining table, a computer table, a coffee table, an end table, and it's just by changing the height length and width around on it. So think about, in fact, even in the library, you'll find all these things that if you just start mucking around with the dimensions of them, they start becoming entirely new objects. Okay, just because you sort of change the relative dimensions of them. Okay, let me go ahead and finish you up because it's just about time for you to go with a lot. Well, that's kind of like the customization stuff. Hopefully that gets you a sense of what you can do with that. Let's go over to rendering land just for a second because that's something else a lot of people uh, want to kind of know about and think about in terms of what's going on. Oh, actually I'm going to go to a different model for that. This is a little model, actually, we did for this thing called the BIM curriculum where it's uh, the Haynes house. It's this house in Indiana, a little Usonian, where you can do things like just turning on the realistic model and you know, get the rendering on the cheap, and that's kind of okay. 
When you go through and then when you want to actually create a rendering, okay, you can bring up the dialog. And a couple things that are sort of important here. The big thing that most of you, I think you know is that you want to start low and kind of ratchet up from there because really even with the realistic settings and not even doing the ray tracing, you want to sort of see which materials are assigned, which materials aren't assigned, so you're not wasting a lot of time doing a high quality rendering of something that's just kind of a dull gray or something like that. Okay. Once you start with draft and you're doing pretty good, render, everything's fine. Yeah. The cool thing is exterior renderings go quickly and it's really hard to go wrong with exterior renderings because if you have the material assigned right and the sun's in a good position, the lighting and everything kind of takes care of itself. If you ratchet on up and I go from low to medium, or as you start ratcheting it up, it's going to take a little bit longer. It's still going to be relatively quick. But things to watch out for here are, oh, there's the whole issue of the resolution, screen resolution. If you're only ever going to show it on the screen to someone, we get a screen resolution. It's a whole lot less data, a whole lot less pixels. If you put it on your poster boards and blow it up to four feet or uh, whatever, yeah. Then go ahead and change it to a printer resolution. It'll be a lot more data, it'll take a lot longer, and okay, then you'll be able to stretch it without it pixelating and stuff like that. So pay attention to that DPI. Um, save them either to the project locally or export them. A very good thing to do with your renderings is even if you can't get all the detail you want in the Revit model, you can export it, take it to Photoshop, and Use it on stuff putting plantings or entourage or different elements to kind of soften and create the artistic effect you want in Photoshop. If you're good with Photoshop, like use that to kind of use some of those things and catch your renderings and make them look real. This is very spare. I could put people and trees and all sorts of stuff to make it look better, but it'll sort of get you going. The type of rendering that actually gives people much more trouble is an interior rendering, which is, I guess, what you guys spend all your time doing. Okay, and the hard part is so much of it really comes down to this issue of just lighting. So if I go through and I say that I'm going to do an interior rendering, considering over the sun, I'll render it. Yeah, it's going to do an okay job. It may read relatively dark. Yeah, that may or may not be bad. That's reading a little bit of dark right now. Okay, so here's the question. Do I go through and start adding all the lights to fill it out? Okay, do I start turning around with the rendering settings? Here's how this sort of works. At low rendering settings, it turns out one of the things that's embedded in that is this notion of how much the light bounces around within the space. So right now, light only bounces twice at a low setting. If you go up to medium or high, it'll bounce three or four times. So what happens is, the light's coming in here, it's bouncing off the floor, it may be bouncing over the wall, but it's stopping there. It's not actually bouncing up and filling up the rest of the space. Part of the reason the renderings on the interior look very dark has to do with just this, you know, what setting you have. The more light bounces you put in there, the more it'll fill out and really kind of soften everything and become much more even. So that's one thing you can do that really sort of increases the quality of your renderings on these interiors, with, even without adding lights. If I just go through and say make that custom and edit that, and I say let's not just stop with two bounces, let me bounce it around three or four or five times, I haven't really changed the amount of light. But it's going to sort of you know, change the way it's considered. Okay, and it doesn't look like it really added a whole lot. What you may notice is it's a little bit graded. It's graded. Graded is a little bit different. It's kind of a, sort of a softer gradation between here and there. It's kind of a little more continuous, which is actually probably closer to true. What you can do also that really helps with these interior renderings <coughs> is go through and adjust the exposure. And this is one of those like sleeper features no one pays attention to, but it's really good. And the principle here, this is very much like in Photoshop, or you, know, you, you go to the, the monumental setting, you take the fantastic shot with the background and your person, your, you know, your best friends in the foreground, and their face is really dark compared to the sunny background. Okay. And you have to go back into Photoshop or iPhoto and just adjust the exposure settings and you can kind of pull out by changing the range of light levels that are being considered. Okay, pull out more detail, you can do the same thing here. There's an exposure value to this and if you want to start brightening up that image, you can start sliding that and kind of tweak it. Don't go way far. If you go way far, you'll just get all whited out. 
But see if you can actually go through and pull out a little more light in the image. And you'll actually sort of uh, be amazed at how much you can get out of it just by sort of brightening it that way, again, without even adding any lights. It just sort of, well, on this screen, it's still looking pretty dark because, you know, it's a, uh, yeah, whatever, the screen doesn't do a good job of projecting that. So exposure control is one thing that really adds a lot to this. Someone the yesterday asked this whole question about, you know, adding interior lights, you know, if you do nighttime renderings and stuff like that. And yes, within Revit, you, yeah, you do that, do you, go, do you guys put in light sources and control that? Excellent, okay, so you guys know, add light sources, I'll just put in a pendant or a tortier just because it's, you know, it's ugly but effective. I'll drop it in here just so I can see it. Go back to that interior. Okay. That also has the ability to change. Right now it's by default set to a 100 watt bulb. If you want to make that a 200 watt bulb or a 300 watt bulb or a 500 watt bulb, whatever you have in mind, feel free to go ahead and change that. Okay. If you go through and render that, and let me say, oh, I'll change it to be um, interior artificial lights only. That'll have the effect of kind of turning off the sun. You're doing this thing and you're saying, hey, it's a 500 watt bulb, but I didn't get much mileage out of this. Your tendency is, oh, I'll put another one in. I'll put another one in. And before you know, you have down lights every three feet in the building or something like that. Yeah, it's, don't do that. Yeah, what you can do is adjust the exposure. And let me see if I can brighten that up a little. Okay. I can get a lot more detail out of that without adding any more lights to it. And the nice thing about sort of doing this thing with adjusting the exposure and doing it that way <laughs> is, you know, I'm doing this without having to rerun the rendering. So you took the time, it took 10 minutes, 20 minutes, it did the rendering. You can still tweak that quite a bit and get a lot more enhancement out of it without having to go back and kind of do the whole thing the third and fourth time and kind of take a big bit on the time. So adjust exposure. Keep track of that one. Okay. Final thing, because I know I'm over, but I'll let you I'll give you one last thing, and then we'll stick around for anyone who has questions, and that is cloud rendering. Okay, just showed up. It's going to be in 2013 as part of like the base product. You can add it in 2012. Cloud rendering works this way. Under the is it add-ins or online? It's the online tab. Okay, if you log into your Autodesk account, you can render in the cloud. So what does that mean? That means that as opposed to sort of setting up the job and letting it run on your machine for five hours, you set up the job, you send it over to the Autodesk server, then it goes to a Google server or an Amazon server or something like that, it renders over there. And when it's done, you get an email message saying, come pick up your rendering, okay, and it comes back to you. Okay. Fantastic service. It is now just about the same quality as if you get out of Reddit, okay. It's not as good as what happens if you take it over to 3DS Max. If you're a 3DS Max Pro and you really are very fine about your lighting settings, it's not going to be as good as that. Okay. But it frees up your machine so that you don't have to sit around waiting. And, you know, you just let it work overnight and you can go do something else like finish up your turn paper, whatever it is you need to do. Okay. Great service. It's being released, I'll say, in an experimental way right now. You have 25 renderings okay, to use this semester. Okay, so what does that mean? Hey, you know, whether you're testing your materials and doing something that's going to take two or three minutes, don't blow one of your 25 on that. Okay. <laughs> if, you know, it's the night before the review or the night before you're supposed to turn things in and you want to turn everything up to presentation quality at 1,200 dots an inch with all the lights turned on and you know it's going to take three days, send that to the servers. <laughs> yeah, get your money's worth out of this. Okay, so we got like 25 freebies, use them wisely or something like that. But yeah, take advantage of that. That's just sort of another thing in there. If you use up your allotment, well, you're kind of back to where you are right now. You just have to render it on your own machine or come in here and put a piece of paper that says, please do not touch <laughs> and hope for the best and see what happens. So you're not going to lose anything, but know that's in your back pocket so that when you're really busy that last night before the review, you can send some things out and let some other computers work for you. 
Okay, so yeah, keep that around. We're gonna send out a link about how to get to some of that stuff. Okay? So beauty, let me kind of adjourn for tonight. Thank you for your patience in kind of doing all this stuff. We're gonna stick around and answer some more questions for whoever who wants to kind of get some specifics answered. But it was a great kind of like I just meeting you and like hopefully getting you started with some things. And if you need things, you know, we're gonna send out contact information and stuff like that between you know and I. We're just here for you. Like, uh, it's all like uh, you know, it's all about getting you through all this stuff. So uh, take advantage of the resources. Cool. Thank you all.